So subscribers to the channel will know already that I recently picked up an Indian Scout with the idea of using it for two up touring this summer. So this video comes off the back of my first tour with Samantha, my other half, and it really serves to give you a quick overview of my first impressions of the bike during our first trip away. So for anyone out there thinking about getting an Indian Scout for a similar use case, my hope is that this video is going to give you some valuable insights. I'll talk about how I prepped the bike ahead of the tour, some of the modifications that we got done as well, the luggage that we used and took along for the trip. And I'll also give you a bit of an overview of things that I might like to change on the Scout for the next trip. So it's going to be a bit of a long one. Grab a copper and let's do it. Now, I know that to some, the Indian Scout might not be the obvious choice for two-up touring, but for me, I really didn't want to go down the route of getting another massive bike like a Goldwing or one of those big, tall ADV bikes. And I wanted something that blends style, comfort, practicality, but also something relatively compact and easy to deal with on the small roads over here in the UK. And at least on paper, the Indian Scout pretty much meets all of those needs. It is absolutely beautiful to look at well i think it is anyway it weighs in at around 250 kilograms so not exactly featherweight but not stupidly heavy either for its class and with a 100 horsepower liquid cooled v-twin it should have all of the power we need for the trip as well So our trip was an action-packed six-day two-up tour across England and Wales. We actually got really lucky with the weather, picked the perfect week for it. The whole trip was nothing but blue skies and sunshine every day, which is pretty rare for the UK. And over a thousand miles, we made our way through the beautiful Cotswolds over to the Brecon Beacons as well, where we hit all of the famous roads. In particular, I would highly recommend riding the A4069, that's the Black Mountain Pass, around 19 miles of stunningly beautiful twisty mountain roads absolutely breathtaking views at the top as well i think there's an ice cream van up there sometimes the whole trip was actually a real mix of you know those kind of fast sweeping a roads we had loads of mountain passes worked our way through a network of beautiful chocolate box picturesque perfect villages and along the way stumbled on a few random bike meetups as well like this one down in stow on the world and we made our way through you know many many miles of really quite rugged single track. Basically, we threw pretty much everything we could at the bike, a real mix of surfaces, different speeds, and at the end of it, got a really good feel for where the bike shines and some of its weaknesses as well. So let's kick it off with how I prepared the bike for the trip. Now, I've only had the Indian Scouts for a couple of weeks. Mine's the 2018 Icon. The Icon edition is effectively the same bike, but it's got the flashy paint scheme in this case, the split black and white with the lovely red pinstripe. It started out pretty stock bar the aftermarket Vance and Heinz pipes, but I did make a couple of small changes before the trip. The first thing I did was to fit a Dart fly screen. Now I've made a full video on that. This is a tinted Marlin version of the fly screen. And with the Indian Scout being a bike that kind of locks you into a bit of a bolt upright position, this screen really did help to clean up the airflow, pushing most of the wind blast up over my lid and definitely taking off quite a bit of pressure from the chest and the shoulders. In fact, neither myself or Sam suffered from any buffeting or turbulence or kind of bad side effects of fitting the screen. We both really did feel like it added significant deflection versus riding with no screen at all. And of course, being a fly screen, it also did a pretty good job of keeping most of the bug splatter away from my jacket. Sadly, my visor still needed plenty of regular cleaning, but it's summertime here in the UK and uh, you, get, you get a lot of bugs. But uh, it did a good job in terms of just cleaning up the airflow, making it a little bit more comfortable at speed. <laughs> The next thing I did was to fit the OEM USB enabled instrument cluster. Now my bike being a 2018, it didn't come with a USB ports like you get on the very latest bikes. So if you want to install one, at least the Indian way, 
you need to replace the entire speedo slash handlebar assembly with the only difference being that you get this little hole in the side of the new units which is where you're going to plug in the oem usb assembly now it's about 170 odd pounds for this so it is an expensive upgrade mainly because you need to replace this entire instrument cluster but i've got to say it's a really neat and tidy solution now uniquely on the 2018 bike you'll just connect it into a plug inside the headlight shell and you're all done but if you've got a slightly older bike that plug isn't there so you need to wire that in first from the battery which does mean running this loom that you get in the kit from the battery under the tank into the headlights and then you're good to go it is a very easy job it won't take you long the only thing to double triple check is that you torque up those handlebar bolts properly for that i use the excellent sbv torque meter and this little device turns any socket set into a little mobile torque wrench you simply dial in the unit and the value you then connect it between your socket and your wrench and it's going to give you an audible set of beeps as you close in to the peak value that you want to hit now the best thing about this is it's actually small enough just to chuck in your bag and take out and about on the road with you so if there's any chance you might need to check your torque specs out and about something like this really handy to have So when I'm out and about on tour, I use an iPhone for all of my navigation. For A to B riding, I generally use Google Maps because it is the most efficient and effective with great real-time traffic. And for seeking out the best roads, I use Caddymoto. Really brilliant app, highly recommend that. Now, mounting the phone to the bars, I actually first tried to use a quad lock, but I just couldn't get the phone really where I wanted it to be, mainly because of the way the quad lock mounts to the bars and the kind of weird shape of the bars didn't work for me. So I had better luck with my trusty old Ram Tough Claw, which got the phone nicely tucked away behind the Marlin screen here, which is where it stayed pretty much on all the time during the tour, uh, no matter where we went. So definitely a worthwhile investment, making sure that A, you can put your navigation device up in front of you, but B, you've also got a way to keep the thing powered up as well. Now, with this being a holiday where the idea is to relax as much as you can, the very last thing you should be thinking about is cleaning your bike when you're away. So I did spend a little bit of time up front applying a long lasting silicon dioxide coating from Autobrite Direct. Now the product's called Supersonic. It's an easy to use water-based spray that you simply apply to the bike and you then buff it off straight away with a cloth. Now this stuff will actually bond to all the painted and metal parts for up to around 12 months and the idea is it just provides a tough ceramic based layer of protection against all of the elements. Now actually we got really lucky as I said with the weather it didn't rain but uh, it was still definitely worth just making sure that we had a little bit of protection there because all this beautiful paint and chrome work we want to keep it as nice as possible for as long as possible so having that there definitely brought us a little bit of peace of mind. Now it doesn't matter that we didn't get to try it last week because because as I said, it will stick to the bike for the next 12 months or so, especially on those painted parts. So I'm pretty sure that in time it will get a proper testing. Now I also installed a set of grip puppies. Now personally, I find the hard plastic stock grips on the bike to be particularly uncomfortable for some reason, but the puppies sorted it out pretty fast. The only other accessory that I added before the tour was actually this little Oxford Cruise throttle assist. Now, I've never tried one of these before, so this is brand new. Uh, the Indian Scout doesn't have cruise control or anything like that. And I really don't like the idea of those throttle locks that kind of locks the throttle in place. A bit too scary for me. But I was actually really surprised at just how effective this little seven pound piece of plastic is. It just lets you relax your grip on the throttle and you rest the weight of your hand, the palm of your hand onto this little plastic lip and it keeps the throttle pinned where you want it to be. Now it's obviously pretty useless at lower speeds. It does get in the way a little bit as well if you don't have it in the right place, but for faster roads, it's actually well worth trying one out. Now, one of the main challenges with touring on any bike is finding a decent luggage solution that can really make or break your trip. Now, just before this trip, I was lucky enough to get hold of these OEM leather panniers from Indian. Now, these are made specifically for the Scouts. They come with a kind of hard plastic case with a thick tan leather outer. Now, they cost silly money 
around £1,200 when you throw in the fitting kits as well. And to be completely honest, they don't actually hold an awful lot of kit either. Uh, the biggest issue with these is actually the small aperture which is going to restrict the size of things that you can actually pack into them in the first place. Now, it's fine for things like clothing, tools, other small items, but it's going to struggle with, well, let's just say for scale, anything bigger than an iceberg lettuce. You get the idea. You need to be a little bit careful there. So considering there are two people going away for six days in total, we had to obviously find an ancillary luggage solution to pack all of the extra bits and pieces in. And for this, Krieger came to the rescue with their all new US 40 rack pack. Now I'm running a non OEM backrest and rear rack on the bike. I will probably get the Indian version soon, but that's uh, what I've got at the moment. So as well as giving your pillion something to lean back on, it also makes for an excellent additional mounting platform for luggage. I and mean, the new Krieger rack pack was really easy to strap down, even onto this rather small rack. The bag comes with these extra long straps, which have a buckle on one end and a hook on the other. So the idea is you simply loop them around uh, a mounting point of your choice on the rack and you fasten one end to the, to the bag via the buckle and the other end to the bag via the hook. Now, the thing I really love about the US 40 rack pack is that you don't actually have to run it as a 40 litre bag because it rolls up from both sides. If you need to make it a little bit smaller, you can continue to roll it up until it's as small as around 20 litres. So you've got a lot of flexibility there between 20 and 40 litres to get it exactly the right shape and size. My only complaints with the, the other Krieger bags I've got, the, the other bags in the dry pack series, is that they do have to be pretty well loaded up in order to give you a secure mounting to the bike. So if you're running like a US 30 and you've only got about 20 litres of stuff, you know, there's lots of opportunity for things to move about. This new design totally eliminates this problem, letting you pack the bag tight anywhere between 20 and 40 litres. And that makes it pretty much all the bag you could ever need for the back of your bike. The quality is as you would expect from Krieger, simply outstanding. And as I said, it will fit on the back of any rack without having to leave permanent straps on the bike as well. So when you're done, you just unclip it all and you're good to go. You'll also see that I added in a Krieger US 5 on top as well. So with the Krieger bags, they're all modular so you can strap them together. This was my kind of day bag for things like tools and locks and visor cleaners, all that kind of stuff. So when we got to the hotel, I'd just drop off the panniers, drop off the US 40 rack pack and run out with the US 5. Also my uh, trusty R3 Krieger belt bag as well for things like camera gear and cash and all that kind of easy access stuff. So the Krieger US 40 rack pack, definitely highly recommended for two up trips. As I said, you can run it as a 40 litre when you've got two people, you can cinch it down to a much smaller bag if you're out and about on your own. Honestly, we didn't skimp on luggage. We pretty much loaded the bike up with all of the creature comforts you could ever need and just got out and hit the road. So the big question is, did all of that weight affect the bike in terms of handling and performance? Well, yeah, of, of course it did, but it was completely manageable. Now I weigh in at around 82 kilograms, Sam's about 48. I reckon we probably had about 15 kg of luggage all in. So we were coming in somewhere around 145 to 150 kilograms of rider and luggage load. That is actually well within the maximum limit of 194 kilograms. So before setting out, one of the really important things you'll want to do is dial in the correct preload on the standard shocks. Now, we measured the fully laden sag at around 280 millimeters on both sides. I actually brought it in just slightly under the recommended 282 millimeters as I was anticipating the fact that we wouldn't be riding fully loaded all of the time. Out on the road, I was actually really impressed with how the Scout performed despite all of the extra weight. Now, I've heard a lot of criticism about suspension on these bikes, and I think a lot of it comes from earlier versions of the Indian Scout. But just remember, from 2017 onwards, the bike actually comes fitted with progressive springs in the rear shocks. So Polaris have definitely tried to address some of that early criticism and I think it's done a pretty good job because spending the time to get the preload dialed in just right I actually found the bike to handle
handle really well with the stock setup. On smooth, fast roads, the bike holds its line perfectly well through corners. You do have to work the bars to initiate a turn in as you would expect on a big heavy cruiser with loads of momentum. But once it's leaned over, the bike just seems to rail through super easy. Even if you do have to make a mid corner adjustment, it doesn't seem to throw out the suspension. It never felt like it was wallowing or bouncing around felt properly planted and positive making for a really confidence inspiring ride so if you want a cruiser that will go around corners well the indian scout won't disappoint you there really my only issue with the suspension was some poor comfort on the very harshest of roads now i'm probably asking quite a lot for cruiser suspension here but with the system in the upper echelons of its load limit it will bottom out if you crash it into a pothole things like protruding manhole covers those aggressive speed bumps now it only happened a couple of times for us on our trip but all in all i've got to say i was really surprised at just how well the stock setup performed despite all that extra weight we didn't have have any major issues at all, especially in terms of handling. Now the other big talking point with the Indian Scout is definitely the brakes. Again, they come in for quite a bit of criticism and I actually found them to be pretty good. I was surprised. Even riding with a pillion and all of our luggage, obviously that will add to the stopping distance on a bike as you're carrying more weight, more momentum. But I found the bike stopped really nicely. Now don't get me wrong, these brakes do not have a huge amount of power. I actually found myself changing the way I ride and using a lot more of the back brake. Now, this isn't something that I usually do. If I'm riding you know, faster bikes like my Aprilia, the back brake is really just about balancing the bike and not really doing a huge amount of stopping work. But on this bike, it was almost completely the opposite. I found myself using the back brake an awful lot. But when I did deploy the front brake, usually kind of steaming into the slightly hotter corners, I did find it to be nice and progressive, allowing for a really smooth and controlled scrubbing off of speed. Just bring them in nice and early. You know, M50s, these ain't. But honestly, for the type of riding that most people do with this bike, they are pretty fine. Maybe down the line, I might stick on a set of performance sintered pads that might help sharpen them up a touch. But the one big complaint I do have about the brakes is actually the lack of an adjustable brake lever. It is actually too far out for my hands. And especially now that I've installed the grip puppies, that's pushed my hand back a little bit further. So definitely something to change down the line. An adjustable set of levers will make a really big difference there for me. Now the bike is still running its stock Pirelli Night Dragon tires and we only got to test them out on hot, clean, dry roads and as expected in those kind of conditions they performed absolutely flawlessly. It might be a different story in the wet but at this stage I can't comment further on the tires. Now, at the heart of the Indian Scouts, of course, we have this spectacular 60 degree V twin. It's liquid cooled with a double overhead cam, four valves per cylinder. It is unashamedly a thoroughly modern engine, and I do thoroughly applaud Indian for not trying to hide it behind this veneer of fake cooling fins or pretend carbs and stuff like that. Instead, it's really kind of tastefully decorated in this beautiful combination of black parts and chrome as well. And of course, being a stressed member, you get this lovely uninterrupted view of these beautiful cylinders without any of the usual scaffolding in the way to spoil it. The upshot of all of these modern features on the engine is that it chucks out around 100 horsepower around 97.7 newton meters of torque at a peak of 6,000 RPM. Yeah, you heard that right. Peak power coming in at 6,000 RPM on a cruiser. And that is a little bit unusual because nothing else on this bike really encourages you to push the RPMs that high. I actually found myself really enjoying just shifting quite early, seemingly, at about 3,500 and just enjoying you know, chilling out in those higher gears. Even on these twisty roads, I frequently found myself uh, hanging around in fifth or even sixth gear and just enjoying that low down pull rather than thrashing it. It might be something to do with the way that the bike sounds at low RPM with these Vance and Heinz pipes, but it's just an addictive blat sound as you rip towards 3K. With anything north of 4,000 starting to feel almost too aggressive for the kind of relaxed nature of the bike. Maybe it's just something to get used to. You know, if you want to push the bike and thrash it into those higher RPMs, obviously that's where the bike's sweet spot is, but I was just really enjoying keeping it low and slow.
Now, riding with a pillion, you of course want to try and keep things as smooth as possible at all times. And despite first gear being a little choppy, the fueling everywhere else is actually really good. With a ridiculously linear power curve on this bike throughout the whole rev range it's just really really smooth and progressive there are no surprises little spikes of power as you work your way through the gears everything is extremely predictable and that just makes it a great bike to ride for longer trips for a big heavy cruiser the clutch is also surprisingly light again this helps to keep things smooth and calm for your passenger the friction zone on my bike is nice and close to the bars giving me loads of control as you feather out the shifts and start to put down power through that lovely belt drive now riding two up with luggage always is going to put a little bit more stress on the engine but in the case of the indian scout with its 69 cubic inch lump it actually took everything in its stride you still have plenty of power on tap to peel away from the cars at the traffic lights you can cruise at legal speeds all day long on the fastest roads and you know work your way up the steepest hills without having to change down the whole setup of the bike with that modern liquid cooled engine just means you've got loads of power almost no matter how much weight you put on this bike as long as you're within its load limits engine's going to do totally fine hey! Now, I want to talk a little bit about the general comfort of the bike. We talked about suspension, but what about things like the seats and the ergonomics and all that? So I'm just under six foot, Sam's around five foot three, and we're running the split rider and pillion seats. And uh, lucky Sam, she also gets the backrest as well. Now, when we first test rode an Indian Scout, the demo bike actually had one of these single seats that tapers back into a tiny little pillion section on the back. I think it took Sam about 30 seconds <laughs> before she did declared the whole thing to be utterly hopeless and this split setup is actually really good although we never rode for more than about 60 miles without getting off to you know see something eat or refuel so we had plenty of short breaks to get the blood flow moving again but we were perfectly happy with the setup i put a little uh, sheepskin on the back of sam's seat just to pad it out a bit more but uh, she didn't complain about any discomfort throughout around a thousand miles from a rider standpoint the bike definitely locks you into a bit of a fixed position and you can't really move about on this seat now for any reason if that position doesn't work for you it's not going to be a great bike because you're not going to have a huge amount of adjustment and you're not going to be able to kind of wriggle around and get yourself comfortable so it's going to be one of those bikes where if it works if you're comfortable in that locked in position great but if you're not i would definitely think twice about this bike now i wear 32 inch jeans and i didn't find that the pegs were too far out for me shorter riders might have a bit of an issue here the bars have got loads of space and scope for adjustment so I was able to get these with just the right rise and the right reach exactly where I wanted them to be as well so big fan of these bars and riding with a pillion on the back with the split seat you will as a rider hardly notice they're there Sam was able to get her feet on the pegs without making any contact with either me or the panniers on the side of the bike either so when it comes to things like running cost and fuel range, honestly, I've got to admit that I didn't properly measure it, really. We probably got around 100 miles to a tank, maybe slightly less. But here in the UK, it's not really a massive issue. We've got petrol stations all over the place. Didn't find ourselves having to plan any fuel stops. It was really just a case of opportunistically topping up whenever we fancied a break. So we were totally fine. Didn't have any issues with the fuel range on this bike here in the UK where we have an abundance of petrol stations. So finally, I do want to talk about the overall experience of taking an Indian Scout out and about on long trips like this, because all bikes are slightly different. They have characters and they, they do just kind of add elements to your trip. Firstly, taking this bike out is kind of like hanging around with a celebrity, to be honest. I mean, literally everywhere you go, people will come up to you. They'll ask to take photos of the bike. They'll have questions about it. And they'll generally come over to admire it and, and, and just talk to you about it. So what I will say is if you're shy, don't get this bike because people are going to want to interact with you all of the time. It is an unusual bike. A lot of people have never heard of Indian and it has such a striking presence. You know, people are just drawn in. They want to find out more. In the past, we've, we've done similar trips in cars and we've had pretty much zero interaction with people along the way. But taking the Indian out was definitely a very interactive experience with the public. And we both really enjoyed it. We met some really cool characters.
We ended our trip back at the bike shed in London. It was one of the hottest days of the year. I have to say it wasn't a huge amount of fun trying to battle through the London traffic as we headed back into town. But here's a good sign. Almost immediately after getting unpacked and showered and all that kind of stuff, we both sat down and agreed that this definitely wouldn't be the last of our trips out on the Indian Scout. We look back with really fond memories, both in terms of the places the Scout took us and the comfort and kind of finesse in which it did it. We both really enjoyed it. Here in the UK, we are, of course, really lucky to have beautiful countryside right on our doorsteps and bikes like the Indian Scout just make it feel so much more accessible. It's got the ability to shrink down those motorway miles into effortless cruises. And of course, when you get to the fun bits, you're gonna have a lot of fun with this beautifully modern V-twin, rev happy, loads of power, and the bike really does handle. So you're gonna have a massive smile on your face right up into the point where you get a jab in the back of the ribs from your pillion, reminding you that you're going too fast. Happened a few times. So I will post up a few in-depth follow-up videos very soon on the channel with more details around some of the mods and bits and pieces that I've done on the Indian Scout. There's more to come as well, so don't forget to hit subscribe for those videos when they drop. That's all for now. I hope this has been useful if you're thinking about the Indian Scout for two-up touring. From myself and Sam, it comes highly recommended. Until the next one, ride safe.